Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Euronurse. We meet every Saturday at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. If you this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our website at Euronurse.com and learn more about us and how you can be uh, participate. And if you're new and you don't know how to send questions, that Q&A box is the one you want to use. Just hit the Q&A and you'll be able to ask us questions. And if you're watching us on LiveTube, that's great. I mean, LiveTube, YouTube, that's great. Um, just be sure to hit that subscribe button and you'll get notified when there's a new video posted. And uh, of course, you're always going to want to like us, right? So we got a great show. We got three great panelists, myself. Well, I don't know how great I am, but I'm here. <laughs> Your host, Vic Sinise. Amy Hall's coming in. She's going to be talking um, on pessaries today. And it'll be a really interesting new subject for us to, to ponder. And then Lori Atkinson is joining us again. Um, as usual, we'd love to have Lori by with us all the time. So uh, stand by. We're going to take any questions. If you have any uh, questions that, that you want to ask us now, feel free to put those in the Q&A box. If not, I think we're going to just go over here and, and hey, let's time to share some favorite stories. Well, let me switch back there. Good. Um, you know, I, we were talking a little bit before we got started, and I got an idea for a story that I, I was going to do the pediatric one. I'm going to save that one. I've got a better idea now. So the one I'm going to talk about is specimen collection. Lori kind of was alluding to something that had happened at her office. So I'm not sure how everybody else does it in the office, but when we ask for a urine sample, we ask for, we give them two cups. We want a double void. So we want the first, and this is a male sample. We want the first, which is the urethral wash, the second, which is the bladder. So we always give them two cups, even put one and two on the cup so they know which is which. So we know which is which and tell them, go into the bathroom and give us a little in number one and a little in number two. Been doing that my whole life. I go to the specimen door and I open it up and what do I find? A little bit of urine in one and a bowel movement in two. <laughs> now I'm surprised he was able to get it in the cup, quite frankly, but uh, there's a little advice for you. Make sure you really specify you want urine in both of those cups. All right. All right, Amy, can you top that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. Give us a story. Well, I was going to give you all a story that's certainly very appropriate for our talk today. And it's, uh, you know, obviously pessaries. And so uh, it's a story, uh, I, I would say, um, you know, you, you titled your, your story as specimen collection, Vic. I'm going to title mine as stick to itness. Uh, we had a patient who came into our office, um, very, very elderly lady from a um, long term care facility. Uh, forgotten pessary. I'm sure y'all have all heard these stories about forgotten pessaries. Family didn't have a clue that the patient had had a pessary for a number of years and the nursing staff at the facility didn't know until she one day started bleeding. She was sent to the ER, uh, a local ER. The local ER could not get the pessary out. And so somehow she, she came my way into my clinic and uh, again, stick to itness. At that first visit, I could not get the pessary out without creating a tremendous amount of pain. Uh, and so what we did was it took us a month, but we got her on some semestrogen cream and started her uh, on that for every night. The nursing staff at her facility had to uh, apply uh, the, the hormone cream uh, via the vagina every night for the next four weeks, brought her back in and went, um, miraculously, we were very, very relieved. We were able to get the pessary out. She had no erosions, surprisingly, um, except for some healing ones. So I guess the estrogen was healing up that, uh, that, um, that bleeding that had occurred. Um, and um, no fistula, thankfully. And we got the pessary out and it was very, very, very challenging, but we were very, very like I said, it was very miraculous because we didn't have the option of taking her to the OR. Just too incredibly uh, feeble and frail. It just wasn't really an option if we could get it out in the office. So again, stick to it, miss. Yeah, that's a great story. It, it, it's a reminder that when we, uh, especially dealing with the elderly, you know, you, you put a pessary and then somebody decompensates, ends up in a nursing home, and you don't even know if their family knows they have it. You know, some people are very 
private about that. And then you get the situation you were just described. So I'm sure it's uh, something it's that a good outcome. Have. Yeah, good outcome, but it could have been a disaster. Right. And um, there's always a, a, a story I remember from uh, some some lecture I was at. The uh, oh, I know Kathy Marchese had talked about this. There was a patient that was using a potato for a pessary, and the problem was it worked. I guess worked fine, you know, inexpensive, but it sprouted one day, and she showed up in the ER with these you know leaves coming out of her vagina, and it was quite the the spectacle. So you just never know. Pessaries can be an interesting uh, walk in life. All right, Lori. All right. I knew you wanted to do a peds thing. So I'll save my peds for when you do your peds thing next. I'm going to follow your yeah. Uh, yeah. little uh, story on the, the specimen. So I don't know if anybody's experienced this before, but we had a patient that's coming from infer infertility, but he had blood in the urine, and what have you, you know, other issues. So we asked him for a sample Well, he was in the bathroom for quite some time. And then when we opened the door to our surprise, he provided a semen sample. <laughs> so that was uh, interesting. <laughs> we were wondering why he was taking so long in the bathroom. But I guess when you tell a patient that you need a specimen, you might want to specify a urine <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> But on a, on a side note, I have kind of a little funny story. So I was unavailable on, on Halloween this year, and I had bought a costume months ago. And I'm going to show you my costume if you can see it. Oh, you may not be able to. Oh, you to. know what? Your, your blurring system is. Oh, it's probably blurring it out. Well, anyway, it's a penis costume. <laughs> <laughs> and it's inflatable. And, and the testicles are quite they're about this big. They're hard to get through doorways. So like I said, I was unable to wear that for Halloween this year. So I decided that on Chris at our Christmas party, I'm going to wear it, but not only wear it, I'm going to decorate it and I'm going to have jingle balls, jingle balls. <laughs> and garland around. And I'm also going to have a beard at the top of the head. <laughs> <laughs> I love to have fun at work. <laughs> hey, that's why we went into urology, right? Because you can that's laugh right. about it. I always tell my patients, or they, they're always asking, why, you know, how'd you get into this? What do you like it? And I'm like, I love it. Where else can you talk the way we do and not get in trouble for it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, oh, we have some stuff here on the Q and A box. Rebecca Strickland, in fairness, the potato was a valid option decades ago. I'll say it probably was, you know, out in the field. Um. <laughs> She would like you to wear a hat or star on top of that penis. <laughs> I thought about that. It's just, it, it's going to be hard to figure out how to keep it on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you'll, if there's a prize for best costume, you should win it. <laughs> for sure. We just had our Christmas party uh, last night and they, we've got probably what most groups are doing. They're merging multiple groups together. And so ours was the first time I think for some of us to see other practices all in the same room but i mean it was so loud i couldn't hardly hear of course that's and, I, and maybe that's why i can't hear out my ear today <laughs> but it was, it was a fun party getting to see everyone though all right well i don't see any other questions coming through but i would like to welcome everybody that's co come to the uh meeting today charlene diane francis gina jackie john kevin leo neil paula rebecca rhonda Susie. Um, thanks all of you for showing up and coming for this very informative talk today, as always. Um, if you get a question throughout the, the day and you, uh, want to say something, um, you know, a, a, a regarding the pestery as you're hearing it, you want to put it in the Q and a, go ahead. Cause then we'll be able to remember to get to those. Uh, Francis Foley said, my name drove me to urology. <laughs> Francis Foley. <laughs> she, she, was, awesome. she was born to be in it. That's um, right. All righty. So let's see, I'm going to switch this over to that view and uh, Amy, you'll just have to hit the share screen and you'll be uh, taking it off, taking over. All righty. Let's see here. All right. So obviously, yes, we are talking non-surgical management for prolapse, AKA pessary management. So I'm going to dive right in and 
and uh, we'll get going with it. So the first questions that we have to figure out when we're trying to figure out if we even wanna use a pessary or if a patient wants a pessary, uh, we have to figure out um, who are the best candidates. And typically those best candidates are the ones that either don't want surgery, can't have surgery, or just want to delay surgery until it's a little bit more opportune for them. Uh, but I'll, in um, sort of the segue to those who can't have surgery, typically a lot of our pessary users, uh, if they're just uh, unable to have surgery, it's typically because of a lot of uh, comorbid conditions that really do diminish their ability to have surgery. They're just not good candidates, increased age, uh, too frail, too elderly to undergo surgery. Uh, for younger women, uh, we certainly see that prolapse is an issue amongst all ages of women. And so women who are still wanting future childbearing uh, potential, uh, they may opt for a pessary um, for use until they do uh, complete childbearing. Uh, certainly patients who may have had prior pelvic surgery may not want to undergo surgery again. Uh, you mean I have to have surgery again? Here I am with another prolapse recurrent. Uh, and they may opt for a pessary. And uh, sometimes we'll use pessaries as a test. Patients come in with prolapse, not necessarily overly bothered by it, but they want to see uh, if it might help the symptoms that they have with their constipation. Uh, maybe their constipation is due to their prolapse. Maybe it isn't. And so you could use it as a test to see if it improves other symptoms that may or may not necessarily uh, be resulting from, from a prolapse. And certainly patients who are candidates for search, excuse me, for pessary have to be open to it. If they are not open to it, it's not an option. If they don't wanna consider it. Uh, and certainly, thankfully, insurance doesn't require that patients attempt pessary management before they can be candidates or, or um, approved for surgery. And so um, thankfully, if patients are not open to that pessary, obviously, if they are wanting correction, they do have surgical options. That certainly isn't gonna be the topic of our conversation today. It's gonna to be all those patients who, who want pessaries. And so we'll, uh, we'll keep it at that. So there's lots of different considerations that we have to factor uh, into um, pessary fitting. Uh, I typically um, bring patients in for a one hour, what I call pessary fitting procedure. Uh, it takes about an hour so that I can discuss the pessary with them. Uh, do the fitting, test it to see if it's going to work or not work, maybe try other pessaries at that visit. If I find a pessary that works for them, that's comfortable, and uh, I've tested it and it stays in, then I also in that visit teach them how to take it out, put it back in. I do strongly encourage my patients to have self-management, and we will talk about that here in just a bit. But not all women can use a pessary. There are certainly some women who may want to opt for a pessary and just cannot use it uh, for various reasons. We can't, for example, achieve a fit. Those patients with short vaginas, again, prior surgery might shorten the vagina, changes the anatomy. Uh, women with much wider uh, genital hiatus, uh, that's the opening of the vagina, essentially, um, from uh, 12 o'clock to six o'clock. So a wide or wider genital hiatus might prohibit a pessary. Um, we need to know the patient's uh, pelvic organ prolapse stage. Um, and so the bigger the prolapse, it might be more difficult to get a pessary fit, or we may have to consider only other certain pessaries that might be more uh, conducive for larger, larger prolapses. Uh, we have to look at the patient's epithelial compliance. So the vaginal epithelium needs to be healthy. Uh, and so certainly an elderly patient tends to be the predominant pessary user. They may be more likely to have a lot of vaginal atrophy. And so we may have to work with that uh, vaginal epithelium first before we can uh, consider that pessary uh, fitting procedure. Uh, it's not uncommon to try two to four pessaries in a fitting. Uh, however, beyond that, it's potential likelihood that we're not going to achieve a fit. If I get to a fourth pessary in a fitting procedure, 
uh, I typically call it and say, okay, you know what, we can come back another day and try some other types that I have. Uh, but it's quite uncomfortable to have in and out pessaries, multiple pessaries in a visit. And I really do want to um, be very mindful of creating a lot of discomfort and potential for vaginal bleeding. So if they're still up for it, I might try some more or we might just call it and bring them back in another day. Uh, I typically, inch, uh, excuse me, uh, what research we have, we don't have a lot, but what little bit of research we have on successful fit, we see ranges between 63 and 86%. I've seen lower, I've seen higher, uh, but sort of the, the, the majority that I've seen uh, amongst research with successful fits is, is anywhere from around 60 to, to 85%. Uh, certainly a fitting trial is a no-lose option for a willing uh, patient. So uh, it, it might work, it might not. And certainly a lot of women, you know what, I tried it and I love it, or I tried it and it helped me realize I do want to get surgical corrections. So it, it's really a no-lose uh, option for women uh, to help them make their decisions. Other considerations, no shape is the right shape. Uh, lots of different shapes to choose from and, and, and there is no specific shape to the specific patient. And really, when we get down to it, we we'd like to try to create and have some science behind it, but there really isn't necessarily a specific shape uh, for stage of prolapse. Um, although we do like to think that our larger prolapses might need some suction producing pessaries. I, I do get pretty good benefit with just good support pessaries that don't create suction, even with larger, larger prolapses. Uh, we do need to re rely on manufacturer guidelines, a lot of expert opinion out there. There's some research out there that does help give us some good clinical guidance. Uh, but there really isn't a lot of, as I said earlier, information out there that gives us uh, really um, uh, strong support on knowing what pessaries to start with or what is the right pessary for, for each woman. We do need to gauge patient's ability or interest to do self-care. Uh, there are a lot of patients in my practice who cannot manage their pessary, and we will talk about that. Uh, but if I can get them to be on board with self-management, and if they're willing and able to do it, I do consider that to be uh, the ideal. Certainly, if a patient has prolapse, but also a history of incontinence, we may want to consider a type of pessary that's uh, continence pessary with support. And I'll show you a couple of my pessaries that I brought with me uh, today. And I'll show you a continence pessary, a pretty common, commonly used continence pessary here in just a minute. So this is just a little bit of information on um, the genital hiatus and uh, kind of giving you a, a little bit of a guide on what pessary might work better for a woman with that larger genital hiatus. Uh, so a larger genital hiatus may be anywhere from four uh, centimeters or more. Um, most women, if you've got about a three to 3.5 centimeter, even a four centimeter genital hiatus, you might be able to go with a ring type of a pessary. This one here is a ring with support, a real good uh, pessary. That's my first line pessary. It's my go-to pessary um, that I typically choose for women who have uh, a smaller uh, hiatus. Women who might have a larger genital hiatus that, you know, four and a half, five or greater um, genital hiatus, I, I often do go with my Gellhorn pessary. And you have options with your Gellhorn. You can do a regular stem, which is this, or a shorter stem pessary. So for those patients with much shorter vaginas, um, you can also opt for a, what I call a short stem. I think it's what it's called, short stem Gellhorn pessary. Uh, because that shorter vagina, as you can see, a little bit of a idea with this, these pictures here, even though uh, this patient in this picture in this schematic has a uterus, most women with those shorter vaginas have had prior surgery and it's usually a hysterectomy or other pelvic reconstructive type of surgery. And so that's typically what shortens that vagina. And that short stem Gellhorn, again, tends to be a really good option. Again, this is a regular stem, but uh, a good option for those shorter vaginas might be that. A lot of the shorter vaginas, I, I can't even get a gel, excuse me, a ring with support to fit because as you see in the bottom left, 
that type of pessary oftentimes sits in the vagina like this. Well, sometimes it sits more like this. And if they don't have the length, then there's no way this pessary is going to be able to sit in that vagina like that. And so that's why that, um, that short stem gelhorn can be a good option. I do use cubed pessaries. They're not my go-to, uh, but I have been using them a little bit more. Uh, the caveat with the cube pessary is I do certainly pick and choose uh, who I'm going to fit with a cube because I really do want them to be on board with self-management. That is my ultimate, I call it my ultimate suction producing pessary. And so I really do want them on board and able to demonstrate that they can remove and reinsert that pessary. So our fitting procedure, as I said, I typically uh, have a one hour uh, fitting procedure. Uh, I always do a speculum exam first, take a look at the, the epithelial integrity. Uh, I don't necessarily need a speculum to, to do a fitting procedure, but I look at the vagina skin. I call it the vagina skin uh, to make sure I, I uh, got some good vaginal epithelium that's gonna lend itself to a little bit more of a successful fit. Again, I evaluate the genital hiatus. I look out also the perineal body, the perineal body being the part of the, I call it the fat pad that separates the vagina from the um, top part of the anus. So that, that thick skin um, and muscle that separates uh, the vagina, uh, the very bottom part of the vagina with the um, um, anus, uh, the anal meatus. Um, so we need a good perineal body, need a good, good thick fat pad there. You need a, a relatively reasonable genital hiatus to, to consider uh, what pessary you're going to start with. Uh, I, I look at length and width of the vagina, and I'll show you all a picture of that here in a minute, but it's essentially two fingers in the vagina. Get an idea of length, get an idea of width. Um, and then I go to selecting my, my pessary from that point. I use a lot of lubricant. I use a lot of the trimesan ointment that comes with our pessaries. Uh, I just tend to do better with that. KY, some patients um, burn with it. So I do pretty well with, with trimesan, lots and lots of trimesan. So again, as I mentioned, this is my picture to evaluate um, length and width. And so essentially, you know, two fingers in the vagina, spread them, you know, as far as I can. If it's this, then maybe I need a smaller pessary. If it's this, a bigger pessary. And essentially, I'm just guiding myself. Okay, I can do this. So that's probably a number three ring with support, which is what this is. Um, if it's more like this, maybe I need more like a five or a six ring with support. So I try to try to give a little bit of um, of objectivity to my fitting, uh, understanding that I typically my rule of thumb is, is I typically try to go small first, work my way up if I need to. Um, I don't like to go bigger first and then have to work my way down. I tell patients all the time, bigger isn't necessarily better. It's just bigger and it may hurt. And that's not what we're trying to achieve. This is just another really nice picture to give you an idea of how we're fitting patients. Kate O'Dell um, is uh, up in Massachusetts. She's now retired, but uh, she uh, did Eurogyne for many, many years and also happens to be an artist and allowed me to use uh, this picture that she and Shanna Atnip had used in um, one of their articles for urologic nursing. And um, just to give you another really good idea of what you're looking for when you're using uh, you know digital exam to try to figure out what size pessary you're gonna go with. So the, um, it can be quite helpful, like I said, um, in helping us figure out the size that might be most appropriate to start with. More on the fitting procedure, most pessaries sit at the vaginal apex, meaning the back of the vagina where the cervix is or where the cervix used to be if they've had a hysterectomy um, or just in front of the cervix. I, a lot of times, am able to get that pessary behind the cervix, so pessary here and cervix is here, um, and, and do pretty well with that. Um, there's really no wrong way for a pessary to fit as long as it stays in for the patient and it's comfortable. Um, a lot of times, you'll see in the literature and in educational information from manufacturers that the distal edge or the edge of the pessary that's most open or most close to the opening of the vagina, so that distal end of the vagina, sits behind the symphysis pubis. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, I can have a lot of pessaries sitting in the vagina. There's that pessary right there at the introitus. It's not sitting behind the symphysis. 
Um, but again, if it works for the patient and it's comfortable, that's okay. I do wanna be able to get the tip of my finger around the pessary. So if the pessary is in the vagina, I want to be able to get my finger around that pessary. That helps me to determine if it's a pretty decent fit. Um, I, you know, if I can't get my finger around that pessary, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a good fit. It's a tighter fit, which may be okay if the patient isn't having discomfort, um, if she's still able to get the pessary out herself, um, or even a tighter fit might be okay if she's not able to get the pessary out um, under our surveillance, our close surveillance, and we just confirm that she's not developing erosions potentially with that tighter fit. And we'll talk about erosions here in just a few minutes. So this is just a couple of pictures that I like to show people about how pessaries typically fit in the vagina. Um, the one on, I think it's your left here, that's probably a ring with support. Um, the idea is that it's, it's fitted behind that cubic bone, but you'll kind of see um, it's, you know, facing that introitus. And if it's facing a little bit more toward the opening, again, that's okay if it's fitting and stays in uh, for the most part for the patient. Gellhorn fits just like that, just in the vagina. Uh, that concavity creating a little bit of suction. So it's a little bit of a suction producer that can be a really good pessary for maybe a pretty good size uterine prolapse. Uh, and then that one on the right there, you can see the tip of the, um, of the cervix. And so I'm assuming it's probably a ring without support, uh, which we'll use a lot of times in our pregnant patients who have prolapse um, and need something to help elevate that uterus, at least until they get further along in their pregnancy, um, when the, the uterus comes up and out of that pelvic rim. Uh, we'll use those kinds of pessaries, rings without support, um, so that uh, they can still have the cervix, not be irritated potentially by that pessary, but uh, long enough until they can get further down the you know, second, third trimester and get that, that uterus up and out of, of, of the pelvis. So confirming proper fit, if we get a fit comfortable to the patient, we wanna see if it's gonna stay. And so we'll have the patient Valsalva and we'll have them cough. And we'll stand them up and have them do those things. And a lot of times I'll have the patient bend and squat and and uh, do the things that maybe she's wanting to do, maybe working in her yard, working in her garden. She's doing a lot of bending and squatting. So I said, you know, hey, let's try that with this pessary in. Let's see if it's gonna work for you. Do the things that you feel like you can't do, that you're not doing, that you're wanting to do. And let's see if this pessary will work for you and let you do those things. And so we'll have them do that. And if it works, stays in, it's comfortable, then we'll have them go sit on the toilet. We put a little hat in the toilet. We don't like to fish. Pessaries out of the toilet, we'll do it if we have to, but we don't like to. So we put hats in the toilet. And if it falls into the hat with them valsalving, um, then maybe we try another size. We go the next size up. If it falls out while they're urinating, if they urinate and it falls out, I'm certainly going to go next size up. I tell patients all the time, if you're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, and then finally that pessary falls out, may not be perfect, but it might work. I tell patients all the time, if I can keep a pessary in 90% of the time, it is not perfect, but it may be satisfactory. So if I can keep it in and it never, ever, ever falls out, except maybe when they're trying to have a bowel movement, maybe they just need to take it out, have the bowel movement, put it back in, or have a hat at home, and there's their safety net. Um, we want to re-examine, once we've had them do all of that, we want to re-examine the pessary and make sure it didn't shift, it didn't move, it's still comfortable. And again, resize if it slipped or if it fell out. If it's uncomfortable, even though it stayed in, maybe we need to size them down. If it didn't stay in and we size them up, we still wanna confirm that they're comfortable because again, we're not trying to trade one problem for another. I like to tell the patient, I want you to be unaware of the pessary or if you're aware of the pessary, it's something you can easily forget. I don't want them constantly reminded of their pessary because it's falling out all the time or because it's uncomfortable. Again, I'm not trying to trade one problem for another. So I don't want them hurting. And I wanna know that their symptoms are relieved. Is, that, 
is that pessary holding that bulge up satisfactorily? And is it helping them do the things that they want to do? Uh, I have a lot of patients who will get a fit and we think we've, you know, paid her, you know, going home with this pessary. She comes back in in about a week and pessary still in, but the bulge has come down around the pessary. Uh, and so we have to do refitting for those reasons. Uh, yeah, pessary stayed in, it didn't fall out, but it's still not the right fit, maybe not the right pessary because it's not supporting her bulge. It's not relieving her symptoms. So I often uh, help patients learn how to self-manage their pessary by doing a lot of um, gyrations in the office. Um, I use models um, to help them understand and to kind of see a little bit more three-dimensionally um, how to remove and replace their pessary. And so um, I've got this little model here. Um, and so I'll often show patients you know, if they've got a ring with support, I'm folding it in half along the big holes. That's the only way it really likes to fold. It doesn't like to fold this way. So I'm, you know, really doing a lot of practice with them and I'm inserting it. Whoops, sorry guys. I'm trying to make sure you can see until I can, you know, get it in. And I'm basically showing them um, with use of models or just with my hand, how to do that to get it in for them in the office. Uh, so we do a lot of practice. I want to make sure, you know, practice is perfect. And if they're not comfortable with it, uh, then we, we can practice. We can continue to practice until they feel comfortable. Some patients will tell me, you know, I really want to do this at home. Just let me, you know, tell me how to do it. and Let me do it at home. I'm okay with that. Sometimes it's easier, you know, in the privacy of their home, they can be a little bit more comfortable and be successful. Uh, but I always tell patients, if you have difficulty, if you start to have trouble with pessary, let us know. We're going to get you back in. All right. So once the patient starts to practice, if she's practicing there in the office, which is the goal, but um, if she's practicing there in the office, I let them take it out. I let them put it back in. And then I check their fit. I make sure that they did it right. And hopefully, you know, they're A-plus students. I give a lot of A-pluses uh, because they do a great job. Uh, they do a fantastic job with their pessaries. And so a lot of it is just coaching and then cheerleading and telling them how good they, get, they did because, you know, it is a process. It, it is a learning, a learning curve. Uh, we want to talk about how to take care of their pessary. Good old soap and water. I tell them body wash, shampoo, bar soap, doesn't matter. Uh, just wash the pessary with soap and water. Get all the soap out of the holes, all the soap out of the holes, and make sure they have good clean hands. They do not need to use gloves. They can use gloves if it helps them grip the pessary better. It's not necessary. They just want clean hands, clean pessary. And these are just some positions for removal and insertion. There's no wrong position. I, I talk with my patients a lot about what's comfortable for them. Some of my elderly patients will insert it on the toilet, remove it on the toilet. Some of them will do it laying on their bed. Uh, it just kind of depends on what they can or cannot do and, and looking at their functional uh, disabilities or functional abilities. Again, self-management is best. Uh, at the very least, I like for them to take it out one time per week for an overnight rest. Uh, so a lot of my patients will take it out Sunday night, put the pessary back in Monday morning. Uh, some patients will take it out every night. Uh, it's not mandatory, uh, but some people feel better with that, and that's fine. Uh, again, a little bit of research we've got did show that at least one time per week overnight removal and vaginal rest did help to maintain a good, healthy microbiome in the vagina, and there was reduced risk for infection, erosions, things of that nature. Um, if the pessary tears, cracks, we do need to give them a new one. Precautions include foul, horrific smelling discharge, vaginal bleeding. I always make sure that before my patients leave the office that they know the three things to look out for. Pain, if it doesn't feel good, doesn't feel better, I need to know. Bleeding, that's not okay. And foul, horrific smelling discharge. I want to check that out. So any of those three things I need to check. Sometimes I need a little bit of help with self-management. Uh, good old dental floss is always a help. Uh, kind of like a tampon string. Helps them pull the pessary out. Uh, they just have to 
use unflavored. It can be waxed or unwaxed, it doesn't matter. If they're going to use a, tan, a dental floss string, I like for them to take their pessary out every night just because that string probably should get changed out every day. It can get kind of gross. Uh, so I would recommend a little bit closer um, self-management a few more times per week if they're gonna use their dental floss or at least use it until they can be more comfortable with re removal and insertion without it. The picture down below is called the Pessary Assistant developed by an OBGYN, uh, it's a website, pessaryassistant.com. I've had several patients purchase it. I think it was like 20 bucks, definitely overpriced. Um, but uh, the, the U-shaped end is the end that they put the pessary in, let it sit in there. And then the device goes in the vagina and helps to um, get the pessary in. The hook on the end helps them to hook the pessary, like that crochet looking hook thing there, so they can pull it out. Uh, the pessary manufacturers do make sure, do make some removal devices as well that patients can also purchase. Uh, but I don't think their, their little hooks look like crochet hooks. They don't have the, the U-shaped end to help them insert. So that's the nice thing about the pessary assistant. Uh, I like for patients to use a lot of lubricant. And I tell them, don't cover your pessary with lubricant because then you can't grip it. All you do is just slip and slide. And so I tell them, put a little bit of lubricant. I like coconut oil really, really well. Uh, put a little bit on your hand, rub it up around the inside and outside of the vagina. Dry your hands off, dry hands, dry pessary. Insert the pessary then because you've got a nice lubricated vagina, ease of insert or ease, maybe more ease uh, with removal. Uh, practice makes perfect as always. So to document the procedure, uh, when I'm fitting patients, I want to document all the pessaries that I tried, so the shapes and the size, because uh, I don't want to go back to something I've already tried if I don't, you know, unless there's a reason I might go back to trying something, but if it didn't work, I'm probably not going to go back. Um, and then I want to know the size and the style or the shape of the one that I was successful with. Um, I'm going to document that I instructed them on self-management or that they're going to be clinician-only management uh, because that guides my follow-up. Um, so if they cannot demonstrate uh, fitting, uh, I want to make sure I have them back sooner rather than later. If they can demonstrate fitting I, and removal, I might let them go a little bit longer uh, before they, I see them back. We'll talk about that in a minute. I want to make sure that they're aware of the precautions to look for. And again, I wanna talk with them about lubrication. It's not mandatory that they use vaginal estrogen. What research we have, can, it's kind of gone either way. Some research has shown that vaginal estrogen is key for helping to reduce, prevent um, uh, problems. Uh, other research has shown that it didn't really matter. Um, it's not a bad thing to use. It does help with the vaginal integrity. It can help with the microbiome of the vagina. Certainly what um, information we do have, estrogen can be quite helpful once an erosion or once a complication does occur. We don't really know if it's a sure bet that it's gonna prevent problems, but we do have pretty good information that it can help improve problems once they've occurred. All righty. I like to see patients back one to two weeks after the fitting, especially if they're not managing it on their own. If they're managing it on their own, I might turn them loose for two to four weeks and, and, and um, give them a little bit of a, of a breather from me. But if they cannot manage it, don't wanna manage it, I wanna see them back sooner rather than later because I don't know, they might have problems, they might develop problems and I don't wanna turn them loose for too long. Uh, let's see, we talked about uh, satisfactory improvement of their prolapse symptoms. Uh, we want to make sure that that's helping, that the pessary is working. Uh, when we bring them back for that follow-up, we want to determine if it's um, helping enough or do we need to consider the next size up or a new shape. We want to talk about any new developing signs and symptoms that maybe have occurred with the pessary. Uh, it is possible that we get the prolapse reduced and we unmask a urethral problem and now they're leaking when they cough and sneeze and laugh and exercise. So they have stress incontinence, not a fault of the pessary. 
but it could be an outcome of the pessary because we've unmasked a weak urethra that may have been unmasked because the prolapse was kinking that urethra off. Um, and so we talk about any new signs and symptoms that have occurred. If new signs and symptoms have occurred specifically incontinence, maybe we want to talk about a continence pessary. So this is a continence pessary with support. So maybe I want to move away from my ring with support and maybe offer them a continence ring with support. Maybe that's something that might be an option for them if they come back for follow-up and they're now leaking urine. And then we reinforce self-management. If they come back to me one to two weeks and they haven't been managing, but now they like to try to learn how to do that, yeah, it's an opportunity to, to work with them on, on self-management instruction at that point as well. When we see them back, we always wanna examine them with a speculum. We wanna make sure that the pessary isn't causing any infection, any sores, uh, and make sure that the vaginal integrity is healthy. Uh, so we wanna look for, again, ulcerations, erosions, abnormal discharge. We resize if needed. Uh, and then again, reteach uh, self-management if they need a refresher or teach it for the first time if they're ready for it. So clinician managed pessaries, once I've got a fit, I bring them back and they're doing great with it, but they don't wanna learn management. I wanna see them back every two to four months, uh, average three months. So at least every three months, sometimes two, depending on their needs. Some patients I'll stretch to four, but it's, I gotta kind of know the patient a little bit first before I stretch her to four. Patient managed six to 12 months. My frail elderly patients, I'm still gonna see them every six months. My young childbearing patients, uh, I might see them just once a year, um, especially if they're doing well. If they're having problems, yeah, certainly I'm, I'm gonna bring anybody back. Uh, so obviously they need to return if they're having bleeding fallout or abnormal discharge pain or the pessary all of a sudden is falling out. Things change. I tell patients that all the time, things change. And so again, we're assessing for ulcerations, bleeding, discharge, discomfort. We wanna make sure that they're able to eliminate, whether it's bowel or bladder, we don't wanna cause problems, we wanna help. We wanna look at, are they leaking now that they have this pessary? Any sexual problems? Uh, a patient who is not managing her pessary very likely uh, is not gonna be able to have intercourse with the pessary in place. Uh, and so we want to confirm that we're not interfering with sexual intimacy with her partner. Uh, the ring with support pessary, you might be able to have intercourse with it in place. Um, and I do have patients who have been successful. And so you'll see that in the literature that it is possible to have intercourse and maintain this pessary during intercourse. But pretty much all the other pessaries, uh, your gellhorns, your donuts, uh, even your continence pessaries, if they're not self-managing those pessaries, we have to confirm that we're not interfering with, with their sexual intimacy and, and, and rest, um, relationships. Uh, if they are sexually active, we do definitely want to really encourage self-management because we don't want to inhibit, again, those relationships. And we want to confirm always that they're satisfied. Are they at the point where they're ready for surgery or at their point where they're just like, I'm done with it? Or yeah, I love this thing. It's the best thing ever. I want to continue. So we always want to make sure we're going in the direction they want to go. Uh, during the maintenance exam, we're going to remove that pessary. We're going to wash it with soap and water. We're going to inspect the vagina. Uh, and then we're going to reinsert the pessary with our water-based lubricant, our Trimisan. Uh, sometimes I'll reinsert it with, an estrogen, with a little bit of estrogen cream if they're using estrogen cream, and I give them a free dose. Uh, so, you know, hey, you don't have to use it until, you know, the end of the week or whatever. So pessaries are easy. So what can possibly go wrong? Lots of things can go wrong, unfortunately. You will see uh, in the literature, if you ever want to take a look at pessary complications, pretty much what we found is that most pessaries, um, complications occur most often because of a neglect, neglected pessary, which is what I mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of this talk today in my, my anecdote with uh, that patient from the long-term facility. Uh, most pessaries that are managed that are whether it's clinician or patient managed, either way, managed and managed routinely and carefully, don't go on to, to develop problems. 
it can happen, sure, uh, but we're managing them, we're, we're guiding them, we're working on uh, helping them. Uh, most complications that do become severe are usually because the pessaries, nobody's aware there's a pessary in place in the first place. If pessary complications occur, it's important to in, uh, reinforce consistent management. So yeah, you know, we have patients who come and see us and then they quit come and see us, quit coming and seeing us. Um, that happened during COVID, uh, at the very beginning of COVID, a lot of my patients were afraid to come back. Again, I have an elderly population. They were very afraid to come into the clinic. And so we had some patients that fell off the radar. Uh, we keep a pretty good list of our patients. And so we were, we were calling, getting them back in, trying to get them back in, but there were some that were lost and uh, we've been able to get them back in, but it was a year, year and a half before we got them back in. And so that was kind of scary for us. Um, and there's little information out there really on guiding management of complications once they do start to occur. And so our next discussion here is gonna be on that and um, hopefully uh, give you some good insight on, on how to manage those pessaries complications. So complications do occur, um, as we've talked about, the most severe being fistulas, thankfully, incredibly rare. Uh, thankfully, it's incredibly rare that you see an incarcerated pessary, but it can happen. Most often it's gonna be infection, bleeding with erosions and granulation tissue. Uh, so that first picture you saw was a pretty good size uh, um, erosion. And then here you see some just real um, redness and friability to the epithelium more of an abrasion, not necessarily an absolute erosion just yet, but it could be on its way. And then we've got one here with also a little bit of granulation in there um, that, that they're seeing. This patient's in the operating room. I don't know if these authors here um, had to take the pessary to the OR to remove the pessary, I'm not sure, or if they're now just gonna repair her prolapse, don't know. So management of complications, typically we use a lot of silver nitrate, a lot of local estrogen, and sometimes we'll use uh, our 60cc piston syringe to irrigate the vagina a little bit, maybe with some normal saline um, to see if that'll help with uh, some of that discharge. We wanna reinforce consistency of self-management if they're managing themselves. Uh, maybe they wanna to transition to self-management if they're not managing. Uh, maybe we wanna, we wanna see them at a shorter interval follow-up. So if they have erosions occurring, maybe I need to see them every four to six weeks instead of every two to four months uh, so I can keep an eye on them. Maybe I want to have them use estrogen. Uh, so we talk about that. Or maybe I want them to increase their estrogen to from two times a week to maybe every other night use. Uh, maybe we need to talk about downsizing the pessary. I tell patients I try to have our cake and eat it too. So if I can downsize the pessary and have my cake and eat it too, maybe they're happy and I'm happy and we still improve the erosions. Uh, maybe we need to consider a completely different shape, or maybe we need to consider at minimum a two to four week holiday from the pessary. Patients don't like that though. All righty. So that was quick, down and dirty. Uh, lots and lots of information in a very short interval. And so um, I guess, uh, Vic, if you'd like, I'll stop share. I know we've got a few questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. All righty. So I am open for questions. Uh, before we get to a question, I have a, a request. You've got yes. the Gellhorn pestry there. You know, when you're on the, yes. um, right, when you're on the screen talking, it's a tiny little screen that we see you. Could you kind of show, you know, how you would put that in? I mm -hmm. think you have the model there too, because. So, if the, the, way, if the yeah. bulge is really big, okay, say the bulge is really big and it's, it's out. I might have the pessary, the patient just put the pessary up against the bulge and go in that way. If it's not that big or it's not out and they can't go in like this, I teach them how to turn that pessary on the side, go in the vagina. So in the vagina with that pessary on the side. And so essentially we're going in as deep as we can. And then it typically wants to self seat. It wants to pop into place and then we just grab it by the, push it by the knob deeper into the vagina. Um, a lot of patients get confused. They think I'm saying you need to fold the pessary like this. No, 
it's folded like that. So I have them demonstrate it to me. I'm like, okay, I'm going to show you this. Now I want you to show me how I want you to, to bend that pessary. And that's how yeah. we do it. That's kind of what I was uh, talking about. It's easier to see it from on the big screen. Um, I think the like, uh, uh, yeah. the Gellhorn, I, I kind of along your uh, line that the Gellhorn and the ring are the two favorites for me with, with support. Um, yep. But the Gellhorn is the one you're going to get the most trickiness with. And I think especially yep. teaching patients. Yeah. I use Gellhorns a lot. It's a good pessary. I use a lot of short stem Gellhorns because I get a lot of patients who have had prior surgery, who are coming to us for recurrent prolapse. And so I use a lot of short stem Gellhorns because I can get a good fit with that shorter vagina a lot of times. I often will use a donut for a lot those really big kind of prolapses that maybe I just need to just fill the space. And to insert that, I'm just literally squeezing it. But they gotta have a pretty good hiatus, as you can tell, you can't get this in. And, and of course there's different sizes of the donuts, but even the smaller ones, if they have a tiny, tiny, tiny hiatus, that may not be the right pessary, but it might be. All right, let's get to some of our questions here. Paula Wagner asked, uh, do you ever use Premarin on the pessary? Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, a lot of times I'll have patients who are using estrogen and I, it's not mandatory. Uh, I do not mandate that patients use estrogen with their pessaries. Um, but if they are using estrogen, they might put it on the edge here, going in the vagina, using it as their lubricant to um, insert their pessary. Uh, so if they're doing that a couple of times a week, then yeah, you know, insert the pessary with the estrogen. Boom, there you go. They get their estrogen and they're self-managing their pessary. Do you have a favorite estrogen product that you like to use? I do. I like uh, just generic estradiol. Um, that's just fine. And I really, really, really like the S-string. I have a very hard time getting it covered by insurance, but I really like the S-string for my very elderly patients who cannot self-manage the pessary, who have a very difficult time getting the cream in the vagina. They may not have that mobility anymore. Uh, or who are also maybe having some issues with dementia and they're not remembering to use their estrogen. So I really like the estrogen because if I'm seeing them at every three month intervals, any way to manage that pessary, they bring a new estrogen in, put it in, take the old estrogen out, check the vagina, new estrogen in, pessary back in, do it again in three months. That might even but other be than that, I like the estradiol, generic estradiol, just fine. That could even be a good talk to uh, discuss how the S I, I've never used the S string. So it'd be interesting. might have one right here. here yeah. <laughs> this is, this is an S string right here. So it's placed. Um, and we just squeeze it in. Like a pessary. It yeah. It goes in. in first. Okay. And yeah, then it goes left in it for how long? Is, say that again. How long is it left in? Three months. Three months. This is a three month ring. And so that's why it works so well with my timing with my three month intervals of bringing them into the clinic to check their pessary. Yeah. It's cost I, uh, prohibitive though. That's the problem. Yeah, I know. That's, that's one of the big issues. I know that at one of our previous talks, we had some discussion about urinary tract infections and the use of estrogens to help to decrease yes. urinary tract infections. So yes. it's uh, definitely a, a good one to know. Uh, let's see. Paula Wagner asked, does urology or gynae or urogyne manage and place them? So uh, who's really doing this? What's, what's your experience? I'm not sure I understood the question. Does urology or gynae or a urogyne manage and place them? So three oh, different. Got it. So I think they probably all do it, right? I hope. Well, most of, at least in my area, most of the gynecologists send to us, to the Eurogyne. Um, so they'll send to us. And then once we get a fit and we confirm that the patient's doing well with that pessary, we get a lot of patients coming from distance. And so we might then turn them back over to their gynecologist just for the routine management. Some gynecologists are comfortable with that, but they're not comfortable or they don't have the stock that we have, um, or, but they're not comfortable with, with 
doing the figuring out what's right, what's not right for them. But once we get them under a surveillance program, some of the, the gynecologists are good with that. Uh, our urology um, partners here at Vanderbilt um, do a lot of pessary management as well. So uh, especially the, the folks who are female urology, they are doing a lot of pessary management. And uh, so we uh, um, kind of have a little bit more of a collaborative uh, vibe there because we, we both do that. Laura, you're in uh, regular urology practice. What's your office do? Oh, I guess you're muted right now. Um, so we don't do pessaries currently in our office. They're looking into it. Where I used to work, um, it was Kathy Marchese, actually, the nurse practitioner. She was a nurse practitioner in our office for a while who actually did them. Um, it was kind of, it was for a short time. So I think the biggest problem was getting people to come back to get them changed. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I, I, I had a question though. Um, I don't want to interrupt the other, uh, other questions that are on there, but what do you do for menstruating women mm -hmm. still? Yeah. So a lot of patients who are younger, obviously childbearing, um, are still having periods. And so they either if they use tampons, they either just don't use the pessary during their cycle, um, or for women who do use pads, they can still use their pessary. Thankfully, the pessaries have the holes so that they can have menstrual drainage as well as, you know, vaginal drainage. Um, but they have to understand that, yeah, that pessary is going to get stained and it's going to turn brown and they don't like that. Um, but if they're okay with it, it's totally fine. Um, they can still use the pessary on their cycle, uh, but if they use a tampon and they, they want to use a tampon, uh, I tell them just take the pessary out during the cycle because you can't use both. Yeah, no, good question. Uh, Rebecca Strickland said, for pregnant patients, is there a standard time in the pregnancy that you remove the pessary or do you do periodic evaluations and evaluate on an individual basis? So most of the pregnant patients who are coming in for prolapse, they're coming in typically in that first trimester. Um, and then as they get further along in the pregnancy and that uterus comes up out of the pelvis, they don't need the pessary anymore a lot of times. Um, sometimes they do. And so those patients, I really encourage them to have self-management. And I don't typically see them back. I'm gonna turn them back over to their obstetrician who's then gonna be managing them uh, and confirming that there's no problems with erosions because we certainly don't wanna do anything to increase the risk for infection, which could potentially be you know, dangerous for a pregnancy. Um, we don't wanna do anything to cause any kinds of cervical erosions. Um, and so, I will see them a few times once we've ensured that they're comfortable with the pessary, it's working, it's meeting their needs. I definitely have them transition back to their OBGYN that they're seeing to, to keep an eye on the pregnancy part and then come back to me if there's concerns. But now a lot of times, some of them don't have to continue with the pessary. They will once they deliver, <laughs> have to go back to it, uh, but they get far enough along and, and a lot of times it's, it's okay. Oh, great, great, good point. Uh, and I think we have our last question coming in here from Paula Wagner, or actually more of a comment, I guess. Um, if you have insurance, not medical or Medicare, uh, I guess maybe that's me um, Medicaid or Medicare, uh, the E-string is covered by the company drug assistance program. Yes, so that a, is correct. And I've been very fortunate with that program. Good point. I have one more quick question as far as qualifications to fit pessaries. Is this something that nurses can do? Does it have to be NPs or APPs? Yeah, so I think it may depend on different each state um, and in and, and, and scope of practice and, and, and licensure and those sorts of things. Um, nurses can manage pessaries. You do not have to be advanced practice to manage a pessary. A lot of the insertions typically fall into the wheelhouse of advanced practice. Now, is it only advanced practice that can do pessary inserts? That I don't know. Um, certainly it's typically advanced practice or physicians, of course, who are ordering 
pessary refitting procedures, who are directing that this patient is going to now come in for a pessary. But the actual fitting procedure, I don't know the answer to the question on that point. But surveillance, uh, certainly surveillance that there are no complications occurring, absolutely can be managed by an RN. Thank yeah. you. Very good. Well, thank you again. Great, great talk, uh, Amy. I'm glad you were able to join us. Hopefully thank you'll you. join us in the future. Um, and again, all the attendees, thank you for all your support and coming back every week to watch this great show and making it as great as it is. Now, if you didn't get enough, remember, you can always go to After Hours. Just click that button on Euronurse.com. That'll transport you to the After Hours where we hang out and just talk about whatever you want. Um, and I'm not sure, Amy, if you've got a little free time, if you want to stop in or not, it's up to you. But anyway, we'll catch everybody next week. We've got more Euro nurse coming at you every week. Good night for, or good, good day for today. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Y'all have a wonderful thing going here. This is excellent. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, and Fran Foley threw in excellent talk, Amy. Oh, thanks, Fran. I appreciate that.